Good morning to you all. I hope you all had a good night last night. And as you all know, the hangover is not the problem. The party was. And that really relates to the topic of, uh, of, of my speech here about the next financial cri crisis. Because we're in the Hayek Auditorium right now, and as Hayek reminded us, as Van Mises reminded us, the recession is not the problem. The boom was. And all the bad investments that we made when we thought that the good times would just keep rolling and rolling. And that gives us a um, clue as to why the markets are a little bit turbulent right now. Because we never really did solve the problems that led to this crisis. We never really lived with a hangover. Instead, we tried to just take another couple of shots of tequila and get on with it. Because, you know, hangover that we can believe in is not a good election slogan. That will not get you elected. But saying that we'll solve the problem, we'll deal with it, we'll build a bridge over this recession, and then we can get on with our lives. That's much, much more popular. So that's why uh, I've, I've written this book on uh, the financial crisis, also a uh, film called uh, Overdose, uh, which will be screened here at Cato on Monday, about these problems that we are still living with and might, we might have seen the worst, the, that the worst is yet to come. The recession is a time to rid ourselves of bad investments. The bad investments that we did in the mortgage markets, the bad risk that we took on when we thought that they were good risks. The recession is the time for creative destruction, to make sure that we dismantle the bad companies, the failed investments, and make sure that work, labor, resources are transferred to more competitive businesses that can create the new jobs, create the new products, the new exports for the future. That is not what we did. The government in the United States and in Europe and all over the world have instead tried to protect and bail out the bad investments in the mortgage markets, in the car industries, in the banks, in the financial markets. So we're still living with them. We're still living with those bad decisions, and that will have a tremendous effect on our growth in the future as well, I think. And we're also, worse than that, we're also creating new bad investments in the market. Because just as we uh, encourage new bubbles in the housing markets after the, the fall of the, the, uh, the dot-com bubble. We have now created new bubbles by lowering interest rates even more, to almost zero percent, which means that almost everything seems like a good deal until interest rates move back to their normal, normal range. So we've created new bubbles everywhere. Around the world in emerging markets, you know when the interest rate is low, it means that you're not interested in holding capital, you're interested in borrowing someone else's capital and create some leverage so that you at least get some return. And that is what's happening right now. You might think that, oh, this is not a good time to hold capital in a bank account because there's no rate of, of return there. Yeah, and that's exactly why no one does, why everybody's buying anything. Stock, natural resources, that dream apartment uh, or, or just about anything out there on the market. So then we'll see a boom in the markets even though it's far ahead of the long-term profits of, of the industries. We see that especially, I would say, in the emerging markets around the world right now. And when we do this, when the central bank, when the treasury department, when the government step in to bail out uh, practically all the bad investments that we can see, what we create is more moral hazard in the market. We reinforce the interpretation that um, financial bets are one-way bet. Because if it turns out all right, then you get to keep the profits. If not, then you can pass on the losses to the taxpayers. And that's what, I mean, if there's one quote that I think sums up the problem of this 2008 financial fiasco that we've seen, it's one of the heads of the Deutsche Bank who said that no, I'm not worried in a fall of uh, asset prices, because I think that the Fed is our friend. Any time that we'll see a problem in the market, they will just step in and supply us with more liquidity so that prices will stay up. They'll practically bail us out. 
And that's what's happening, what's happening right now. It's not just the Fed that's our friend. It's the Treasury Department. It's the European Central Bank. It's governments all over the world. They give us another shot of tequila, lower interest rates, more taxpayers' money, more and bigger loans to deal with the risk that we already took on. And as a banker told me recently, the times are great because now people are borrowing again, massively, because the interest rates are so low. Well, isn't that a bit short term? What happens when, when the interest rates begin to climb again? Well, then the government will step in, as they did the last time. Isn't that great? Well, it's great for some time. A crisis that was uh, at least partly the result of too low interest rates, too much debt, too many bad investments, and a safety net for the financial industry that made too many people take excessive risks, have been dealt with now with even lower interest rates, with even more debt, with even more bad investments and saving the ones and bailing them out that we already had, and a stronger safety net for the big companies, the big banks, the big financial institutions. No lender is ever going to be in doubt that they are going to be given the money back from the taxpayers if the worst happens. The solution is the problem. That's why we had the problem in the first place. As economist and Nobel laureate Vernon Smith says in our film Overdose. In a way, we're back to where we were in, the two, in 2003, 2004, when we say, oh gosh, that's great. At last, a sigh of relief, because now we're out of the worst times. The worst storm has passed, in low interest rates and, uh, and a lot of stimulus has helped us to get past the problems. The difference this time is that now we've taken on much, much more debt. Because no one has paid his debts after this crisis. What has happened is a bizarre Ponzi scheme where the next person, the next institution with a larger pocketbook just steps in and takes on that debt. And when they can't pay it, the next person does. When we had European banks and European uh, companies ready for bankruptcy, the European states, governments, they stepped in and paid for it. Now the European countries and states and governments are in a crisis because they took on so much debt. Then the European Union had to step in with a $1 trillion bailout package last week. And we see the same thing here, of course. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, they can take on a lot of bad mortgage debt. And then the federal government can step in and take on Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac's debt. But who is going to save the United States? Who is going to save the European Union? We can sweep the problems under the rug for a while. But after a while, that rug is so big that we need another rug to sweep that rug under it. In the end, we're going to need a really, really big rug. So we're focusing now on Greece. We're focusing now on Portugal, the countries that seem to be the most shaky for the moment. But they are not alone. Far from it. The British government that now takes over power in Britain, they face a budget deficit that's almost Greek. And the American public debt within two years will have the same level as Portugal. And I'm sure Dan Mitchell will, will scare you more about these, uh, these problems uh, ahead. But that's just the beginning, because then we have the, all the unfunded liabilities for retirements, for uh, health care. If we were to, be, if we are not going to reform these systems, then we were going to have to pay in the European Union and in the United States about 8% of GDP every year to deal with that. And that's if Obamacare doesn't add a single penny to those liabilities. As Margaret Thatcher put it, the problem with socialism is that sooner or later you'll run out of other people's money. And right now we are running out of our children's money and our grandchildren's money. For the moment, it might feel safe, especially if you've got a reserve currency such as the dollar. It feels safe. People are still interested in buying something, buying some sovereign debts, some government debt. But that's what they said at Lehman Brothers as well on Friday, the tw September the 12th, because the markets were still interested in lending them money. They still believed in them. It took Lehman Brothers 158 years to build that credibility. It took them a weekend to lose it when people understood that they will not be able to put their financial house in order. So to sum up, 
We have tried to bridge this recession, but the bridge that we built was so expensive that we will have problems with the growth rates in the future. It'll be a problem uh, to, to build something more out of this bridge. It's a bridge to nowhere, in other words. Basically, I am an optimist by nature and uh, because of, of my, my historical uh, studies. Partly because I realize that people always make mistakes. In every generation, we make horrible mistake and mistakes. And yet, we've created the richest civilization ever. So we'll probably be able to deal with these problems as well. And to put it in perspective, the reason why last year was so horrible was that it was only the second best year in mankind's history when it comes to the total production of goods and services in the world economy. But it was so horrible because we all thought that it was going to be the best year. So all our calculations and all the prognosis was built on that. We can do it. We can deal with those, these problems. But it takes a lot of creative destruction. It takes real investments, savings and hard works, work. And it takes a lot of reforms to make the economy more healthy, ready for more growth in the future, reform of these entitlement systems that we will see. And this is the problem, of course. As Thomas Edison said, Opportunity is missed by most people because it is dressed in overalls and looks like work. Well, the road to recovery is missed by most people because it's dressed in overalls and it looks like work. But if we can get this message through about the difficulties this time, but also about the possible solutions, the road yet to, to, uh, to travel on, then we can do it. But time is of the essence, especially with these debts that we're building right now. And time is not working in our favor. And the clock is ticking. <laughs>